Folks, this is Turlow Tales, and here is the man himself, nearly ready, complete with pint. It wouldn't be any other way, Mr. Mark Strickson. Sir, I was expecting a big build-up, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's Mark with a pint. Yes, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Wow. It's bright, isn't it? It's very bright. Thank I'm you. sure you're all right. Um, should we start now and move backwards? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us about what you're doing nowadays? You live in Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand. Yes. What, yeah. Your career has changed a bit. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, so, okay, how did I end up in Dunedin? Okay, I currently have just stopped working for National Geographic. Um, so, to enable me to go backwards, I should say that for <laughs> some years now I've made natural history programmes and adventure programmes and history programmes um, as a producer. Um, so I ended up in the South Island of New Zealand. Let me tell you, because it's interesting that people don't really know about New Zealand, really. They know about Lord of the Rings, right? But they don't realise that when you look at the atlas, the map shrinks when you get to the bottom of it. So New Zealand is much, much, much bigger than you think it is, right? So for me to get here, assuming I'd done it in one, th in as, as short as I could, I'd have had to have flown two to two and a half hours to another airport in New Zealand. That's just in New Zealand. We haven't left New Zealand yet, right? Um, I live in the equivalent of Northern Scotland, and I'm flying down to London to get an international flight out, right? So I fly from the north of Scotland down to London in New Zealand, the other way round. Um, then I fly, I think it's five hours I do to Melbourne, which is the nearest Australian place. So, five hours to Melbourne. Now, think where you can fly in five hours from London. Well, you can fly well into Africa. And I haven't, an, and, 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 and according to English people, New Zealand's somewhere near Australia. <laughs> well, get off the five hour flight, right? And you don't feel it's near. I then flew 14 and a half hours to Doha in the Middle East, which is where I'm, we'll come back to this, it happens to be where I'm working at the moment. That's 14 and a half hours. Then it's eight hours from there to Heathrow. So it's a hell of a long way away. I mean, I live further away than you can live to England than anywhere in the world, other than if you lived on Antarctica. And we have icebergs. We actually had icebergs coming past our coastline. We have penguins and albatrosses and all sorts of things like that. And it's freezing. Um, it's really cold most of the year. Um, we don't really get a summer, um, which is why I'm this colour. Because um, I used to... I used to live in Australia quite a lot, and I used to turn up at conventions and be really tanned. I'm now the whitest person you will ever meet. <laughs> because I live in New Zealand, and even if there's a summer, as it happens, I was, in, I was filming in Doha, in the Sahara. I was filming in the Sahara Desert this summer. And I missed the whole of the New Zealand summer. And when you're filming in the desert, you have to completely cover up. So I, am, I actually haven't... So I came, I am the only person in the world, probably, who came for their summer holiday in the last two weeks to Huddersfield. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many people come to Huddersfield for their summer holiday? I did, because my mum and dad lived there outside the Cone Valley, and the weather's been shite. And I brought two pairs of shorts with me, and it's been tragic. You should have come six weeks earlier. We had yes, I know. Oh, well, <laughs> And this is supposed to be comforting. Why does everybody <laughs> say, you should have been here to this? And, and I make wildlife films. You should have been here three weeks ago. There were loads of snakes about. <laughs> no, but then the snake man came and got them, and they've all been killed. And now there won't be any for about three months now. You know, it's not still in my life. So, uh, if this is making any sense. I, I, I now live in the south island of New Zealand. I am physically working in the Middle East, making a series of programmes for National Geographic Channels International. Um, but I do live in New Zealand. Um, and to go backwards slightly, bits and bits, it's, it's, it's easier to go forward. So I'll do it very, very, very quickly. When I left Doctor Who, I acted for five or six years in the UK. My then wife, Julie, 
um, wanted to do something completely different and she wanted to go to Australia and go to university and do all sorts of things. She's now a doctor of anthropology. I went with her, anyway I was perfectly happy to go, um, and I did a zoology degree. I then came back to London um, because our relationship had broken up by that point. I then came back to London and I wrote three films. One was called The Ten Deadliest Snakes in the World. One was called Kangaroos for National Geographic, it was National Geographic Special about the evolution of the kangaroo. And one was called The Flying Chipolatas. <laughs> <laughs> flying or frying? Flying. Oh, OK. The Flying Chipolatas. OK, so I'd done a zoology degree, and I had a lot of experience in television as an actor, so I thought I'll combine the two. I might be, maybe I might be a wildlife presenter. Maybe I might, anyway. So I wrote these, but at the end of the day, you have to write stuff to get into television, as far as I could work out. So I wrote three films, and I sent them off to various film companies, and a company down in Bristol was very interested in them. And they bought two of them. And they said, you can work for us for peanuts or we'll give you money for just the scripts. I said, I'll work for you for peanuts. Um, one of the films was called The Ten Deadliest Snakes in the World because they're all in Australia. And we sent out for somebody to present this film and a lady called Terry Irwin set, sent her husband, a video of her husband in Steve Irwin, The Crocodile Hunter, and it was his first film. And I became a name director once I'd made that first film, because it was an incredibly successful film. Um, and since then, I've been knocking around the world, literally knocking around the world, making natural history programs and adventure programs, sometimes history programs. Um, but not acting. No, but I sort of act all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Only because it's interesting. I've done a huge amount of work with presenters. And in order to get a presenter to do the right thing, you have to say, you have to have the same energy level. So I always say that my acting was, so when I worked with Steve Irwin, you know, it was, it was, it, it, it was, it was about getting a performance out of him. The guy had never worked on a camera before. He didn't know what it was about. It was really, really, really difficult. We had a stand-up fight on our first day. And he was built, he was built like a brick shit house. And we were exactly the same age, Steve and I. Uh, and, and both pretty strong personalities. And we, we hadn't met until we were on location, which was right in this really, really weird place in the north of Australia, in the middle of nowhere. And he didn't have Terry with him. And, um, and he was nervous, and I was nervous because I'd never directed, you know, anything like that before. And it was an absolute disaster. And we were trying to film these sea snakes, and there weren't any sea snakes there. And he's saying, well, you know, you were supposed to organise this, Mike. You're the sea snake guy. I said, I'm not the sea snake guy. Uh, you know, you're supposed to know where the animals are, Steve. You're the animals guy. You know, I can't do bloody everything. You know, I've got the cameraman here. I've got everything else here. We're in the middle of nowhere. There's no sea snakes. He said, it's your fault. He said, fuck, I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> so anyway, so we go, to, we go to bed in this... Sorry, could you rephrase that? Yeah. <laughs> so we, 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 you've got no idea how remote the north of Australia is, right? Is it, it even worse than Huddersfield? It's much worse than Huddersfield, right? It is so remote where we were, right? It's, um, it's just so remote. It's like, if you woke up there... Well, how can I explain where we were? We were halfway up the Gulf of Carpentaria. Well, we were more or less down the bottom, right? There are some prawn fisheries there. If you get a camera out, people run. Because a lot of people there are on the run from the law. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get lost in the north of Australia. There is major drug growing, um, huge cannabis plantations. Um, it is a lawless area. Yet they have a policeman. There's one policeman for the size of an area the size of Wales. So how the hell is this guy supposed to keep control of things? There's no way he is. So it's a, it's a world unto its own. So if you pass two sticks crossed like that on a road up there, you don't go any further because there'll be lots of guys with machine guns and they're harvesting the drugs. Right? So you don't go there. Right? And this is, this is the sort of area we were in. And um, it's an area I grew to know and love for about five or six years I lived up there and making films for Discovery. Um, but, but to cut a long story short, the story about Steve and I's first day, which became even worse, was that Steve left his boots... Boots. Wear boots everywhere. Um, we'll get back to planes taking off in a minute. Uh, <laughs> we'll get on to Doctor Who in the end, don't worry. 
he left his boots, which Terry had come back from America, this special pair of boots. He left them outside his, outside his unit. You could only call it a unit. They don't really have hotels up there. They have tin shacks in a row. And, of course, the dogs got them. The wild dogs got them overnight. So the next morning got even worse. Stephen had his boots nicked, right? So I've got a presenter who's got no shoes, right? So Steve comes to me and he says, my boots have been stolen from outside. I said, no, I said, it'll be the dogs that have taken them. I said, but you're supposed to be a man of the bush, Steve. You don't leave your bloody boots outside. So at that point, he had to have my boots. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was going like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, Steve and I became very good friends, and we made some very good films together, <laughs> and it was very nice. But I think both of us were on a steep learning curve for that first week, definitely. Right.